Which coins are going to pump and which will dump? Well, one of the biggest factors here is whether these coins exist within a strong narrative. You see, narrative is the North Star that cryptos follow on their journey to the moon. So in this video, I'm going to give you our update on the hottest narratives to watch for Q3, as well as mention a few projects to keep your eyes on. Be sure to watch the whole way through. Firstly, despite having a background in financial advisory, nothing that I say today can be considered investment advice in any way. It's purely educational content meant to inform and not sway your opinion. Okay? Also, uh, we here at Coin Bureau may hold some of the coins or tokens mentioned, but they will be clearly pointed out to you. Full disclosure, it's very important. Now, before diving into the narratives, I think it's important to break down why they've been chosen. You see, the word narrative, it's quite a broad one and encompasses many things. Is a particular technology a narrative? Or dApps on a particular layer one? Or layer twos on a layer one? Or what about alt ones themselves? What about infra narratives like modularity, parallelized EVMs, perhaps? The point is that there are a lot of potential narratives out there. But if we want to try and hone in on those that have the most potential for price appreciation, we have to focus on those that are compelling and easy enough for retail to understand. I mean, sure, in the long run, these other narratives are important as they will power the tech for the new crypto ecosystem. But in the next bull cycle, the narratives that are likely to resonate with retail are the ones which are easy to understand and that they can relate to. And if you're wondering when that next alt season will come around, well, check out my video from that last week. Okay, with that out of the way, let's dive in with the first narrative. Oh, and I should point out that these are in no particular order. The first narrative is Deepen. Now, a quick bit of terminology rundown. Deepen is an acronym that stands for Decentralized Physical Infrastructure Networks. It's basically blockchain-based management for real-world facilities and data. We're talking about computing power, storage, wireless networks, mapping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see an example of the broader Deepen sector with this map over here from the folks at Masari. Deepen uses token mechanisms with built-in rewards to help incentivize people to uphold the network. It's important to make the distinction between this and most other crypto use cases, and that's because it's one of the actual use cases that deals with physical networks that are used on a daily basis. This is as opposed to financial applications or payments, the primary use case most people attach to a blockchain. Now, why is Deepen a bullish narrative? Well, because far more people need internet connectivity than they do to conduct on-chain swaps, for example. They have much more of a need for computing power and storage than they do for DEX lending. This is why Deepen better fits into that retail pitch, which I mentioned earlier. It's not that, of course, but the fact that the current infrastructure landscape just isn't fit for purpose. I mean, most people have no idea how centralized our physical networks are. This means that they are not only susceptible to going down, but also general network censorship. Deepen is a narrative that actually really could challenge the dominance of the likes of Amazon, Google, Nvidia, or mobile network providers, for example. The reason for this is because Deepen can benefit from a broader flywheel. Effect. It's basically the concept that token rewards incentivize people to supply something to a network. I mean, think computing power, storage, mobile hotspots, etc. These are called the supply side. Then, as we get more coverage, it attracts more product builders, devs, and end users. This generates fees which attract more service providers. And of course, these usage stats create a relationship between network usage and price, which thereby, of course, encourages more on the supply side. A Masari report on Deepen from earlier this year postulated that the flywheel effect could add $10 trillion to global GDP in the next 10 years, and a further $100 trillion in the decade after that. 
is pretty punchy. But what's even punchier than that is that they estimate the Deepin sector to have a market value of 3.5 trillion by 2028. Now, I happen to think that this is a bit too optimistic, given that the current crypto market cap is only about 2.5 trillion. But even if it's just half of that growth in four years, it's a massive move up. This isn't all just theory, though. There has been a large expansion on the supply side of the Deepin ecosystem as well. The Deepin sector added over 600,000 nodes last year. On the demand side, decentralized compute projects like Akash have seen record growth in CPU leases. Helium Mobile has seen subscriber growth outpace projections. There is also a great deal of investment flowing into Deepin. For example, Masari said that there was over $1 billion raised by some of the largest Deepin projects at the beginning of the year. This is one of the most well-funded sectors in crypto. And finally, Deepin has definitely captured the excitement not only of crypto publications, but also the broader public. Here are the crypto reports that mention Deepin as a sector to watch, and here are the Google Analytics search trends. Of course, this is just scratching the surface of the Deepin sector and its potential. We recently did a complete Deepin video where we actually summarized that Masari report. I'll leave a link to it down in the description for you guys. In terms of projects to watch in the space, well, we already mentioned two of them, but other exciting ones are Hive Mapper, which is decentralized mapping, Batensor, which is decentralized compute, and World Mobile, which is another decentralized mobile play. However, another project to keep a lookout for on the Deepin infra side is Peak Network, which is a purpose-built Deepin layer one. The Coin Bureau actually invested in it and just did an AMA with the team over there. That's in our Discord server, which is also linked to down below. As with any new technology, there are still challenges. We need to solidly get that flywheel running with non-native Web2 users engaging on the demand side. Similarly, the time horizon to build applications is significantly longer than for mere consumer apps, for example. And the biggest wildcard variable of them all is, of course, the Web2 behemoths themselves. Don't think that the current market leaders are going to sit idly by as Web3 competitors eat into their market share. They're going to fight it just like their TradFi compatriots have done with traditional crypto. Okay, so that's Deepin. On to the next narrative though, and this is one that you have to take note of. But before you do, if you're liking this video, then give this video a like to give it a boost. You may as well also want to subscribe and turn on notifications as well. It'll be well worth your while, I promise. Anyways, back to the vid. The next narrative to look into is GameFi. Now, this is a narrative that has been around for quite some time. It was hot in the previous cycle, and I remember how bullish everyone was about it. This was at about the same time that traditional games were looking to include NFTs, and the reception was, shall we say, frosty. Indeed, during the previous cycle, some of the top games like Axie Infinity, etc., were about as interesting to play as watching paint dry. Actually, that's a bit of an unfair comparison. Watching paint dry isn't that boring. So it's safe to say that there is a spotty record for the GameFi space. However, Things have changed quite a lot since the last cycle, and there have been a number of high-budget games that have launched or are about to launch. Games that have taken years to develop. Games that gamers would actually want to play. Not only that, but the infrastructure being built around Web3 Gaming has been growing ever since. You can see over here the growth of new gaming networks over the last three years. This is despite the depths of the previous bear market. It's not just crypto native startups, but established gaming companies are also barreling headlong into Web3 gaming. For example, CoinGecko recently reported that 29 of the world's 40 biggest gaming companies are investing in Web3 gaming. A research report by Game7 published towards the end of last year revealed that since 2018, there has been over $15 billion that has been invested in Web3 gaming. So why is there still all this bullishness for GameFi? 
Well, that's because it's another narrative that has a decent chance of onboarding millions into Web3. We've all seen the stats. 3.3 billion gamers worldwide, $176 billion in gaming revenues per year. That's projected to reach $504 billion in 2030. Beyond all this, there is the fact that the average demographic of gamers should line up with those who are more likely to adopt crypto. There is also the compelling case of owning an in-game asset that exists out of the centralized walled gardens these games usually exist in. But perhaps the biggest reason as to why GameFi has a chance at redemption this cycle is because of the sophistication of these games. Just look at the gameplay for Shrapnel, for example, a, a third-person shooter. You wouldn't think that it had Web3 components. There are more examples, of course. Here is the gameplay for Off the Grid, a battle royale third-person shooter. It's one of the most anticipated launches by Gunzilla Games, a large established gaming company. The Coin Bureau actually invested and are looking forward to the launch in a couple of months. But GameFi is much broader than just gaming titles. You can gain exposure to the sector by investing in infrastructure as well. Part of the reason that I'm so bullish on Avalanche and have it in my personal portfolio is because their subnets are becoming the go-to networks for Web3 games to launch on. Both Shrapnel and Off The Grid are going to be using Avalanche subnets, by the way. You could also say the same thing about gaming-focused Layer 2s with Immutable, for example. Their passporting feature has seen over 1 million signups so far, and Arbitrum's DAO just voted to approve a $215 million gaming ecosystem fund a move which could supercharge game deployment on the Layer 2. Some of the Coin Bureau team members hold these tokens in their personal portfolios. If you want to see what else they hold, then why don't you check out the Coin Bureau Club down below. So it's quite clear that GameFi is going to be one to watch this cycle. But are there challenges? Well, there always are. In this case, gamers themselves still remain some of the biggest skeptics. I don't know if you have spoken to any hardcore gamers yourself, but they are incredibly protective when it comes to their gaming titles. Quite simply, don't with their games. Therefore, I think the best chance for broader adoption is not for established gaming titles to integrate crypto, but for the newer games to make the case for gamers to play it. It would also help, of course, if there were Web2 gaming streamers who are on board and helped to play these games. Quite simply, if a Web3 game is going to take off, it has to be a game that is exciting to play in and of itself, with the token economy being ancillary to it. Then the final challenge for GameFi more broadly is scalability. While we have limited adoption right now, the games may appear to be performing well. But when you have hundreds of thousands of gamers logging on and interacting with a decentralized network, any lags or delays will drive them up the wall. It reminds me of back in my gamer days when um, many a broken computers would attest to the fact that I would not tolerate lagging at all. That's why it's really important that games have the right infrastructure to deploy and build on. Okay, so that's GameFi. And time for another new narrative. Or should I say a reborn one? Real World Assets, or RWA, is also all the rage these days. But what most people tend to forget is that they are a reincarnation of security tokens from the 2017 cycle. But we'll get onto that in a bit. Firstly, what are they? Well, quite simply, they are tokenized assets that exist in the real world. It's the process of bringing these assets on chain. There are many different assets that can be tokenized, everything from property to bonds, equity to commodities, credit to art. I mean, the list goes on. And there is a compelling case for RWAs. That's because the process of tokenization on a blockchain leads to ease of transfer and storage. It's also much easier to fractionalize assets than it would be in TradFi. This adds more liquidity to the fractionalized shares. But perhaps the biggest advantage is that the blockchain provides an immutable record of ownership. Now, this may not sound as important to you right now, but it's crucial in times 
when centralized records can be scrubbed. It reminds me of a story that I was told a few years ago by someone who was actually forced to flee Iraq because of the civil war that ensued after the US invasion. They left all their land, of course, when they fled. However, during the war, all the centralized land registries were destroyed and the government cronies took over the land. Fast forward to when the war ended and they wanted to go back to the country. Of course, they couldn't get the land back because, well, there was no record of ownership. Bringing this back to RWAs, this is the reason why on-chain verification of ownership is so important. Now, the RWA space has seen an explosion in the past year. I mean, you can take a look at the total value locked that has been locked up in RWA protocols, for example. It's not just random crypto projects launching novel RWA tokenization protocols, but massive behemoths are thundering in as well. I'm sure you will have seen the news about BlackRock's Biddle Fund, which is growing at a blistering pace. By the end of April, it already captured at least 30% of the 1.3 billion tokenized treasury market. They aren't the only ones, of course. There is also Franklin Templeton, which has a tokenized money market fund with ticker Benji. Now, treasury tokenization is the fastest growing RWA token type, and that's just because they are the biggest asset class in the world. But there are a whole host of other financial assets that will benefit from tokenization. According to a report by BCG, they estimate the tokenization of global illiquid assets to be a $16 trillion opportunity by 2030. They also estimate that by the same year, the tokenized market will contribute 10%, 10% to global GDP. In addition to this, Citigroup released a report that has the following eye-popping stats. Real estate tokenization will reach $1.5 trillion by 2030. Sovereign debt to reach 1.9 trillion and tokenized repo securities lending and margin collateral to reach 1 trillion. Quite simply, the TradFi giants are bullish AF on this opportunity. But how do we benefit from it? Are there any projects to focus on? Well, it's not as straightforward. You see, generally large TradFi is looking to either use large public blockchains, think Ethereum, for example, or issue tokenized assets on their own proprietary chains and walled gardens. JP Morgan has done the latter with its Onyx tokenization platform. And speaking of which, they joined up with WisdomTree to trial a proof of concept for tokenized funds on an Avalanche subnet. Another reason why I'm bullish on Avalanche. So quite simply, the best plays that we see for the RWA narrative are either well-established L1s where the tokenization will take place or large infrastructure providers which facilitate the tokenization. There are a number of platforms that are trying to do this, but the one with perhaps the most traction is Ondo Finance. There are already several on-chain funds that have been launched over there with a focus on US debt. Ondo does have a governance token, which you can of course hodl, but do note that the only use case for it right now is, is voting in the DAO. But it's naturally a beta play on the Ondo Finance growth and the broader RWA narrative. Okay, so, RWAs are a compelling narrative, but what are the challenges? Well, for one, lack of standardization is a problem. These are regulated assets, and as such, each jurisdiction should have different policies and procedures. These differences restrict the creation of a universal framework for tokenized RWAs. It's also quite a leap of faith to get many retail users comfortable holding a token of an asset compared to holding the physical record of ownership. I mean, sure, we all know that in reality, the latter is less secure than the former, but they don't. I also happen to think that some assets are better suited to tokenization than others. I somehow don't think that most investors who buy you know, real estate, for example, would be keen on holding a token. It is a different story, though, when it comes to treasuries, stocks, and bonds. Finally, let's not forget that we have been here before. I mean, as mentioned earlier, the security token buzz of 2017 was one that fizzled out and many issuance platforms came and went. In order for RWA to not suffer the same fate this cycle, they need that, well, real-world adoption. Moving on, though, it's time for the final narrative. 
Drum roll, please. Boom. And that's meme coins. Now, hear me out, hear me out. I know that there are many of you that will recoil at the thought that meme coins are mentioned as a promising narrative. Indeed, we pushed a poll last week asking people's opinions on meme coins, and most thought that they were net negative for the space. Whether you believe that or not, and I've seen good arguments on either side, we cannot just deny their existence and broader phenomenon. They are by far the most profitable narrative of this year, with the top 10 meme coin tokens up over 1,300% in Q1. For context, RWA, which we just mentioned, that comes in at a distant second at 286%. So instead of turning our noses up at these meme coins, we should rather try and understand why there is this craze and whether we can benefit from it. Well, for one thing, memes are incredibly easy to understand. In fact, they are perhaps the easiest narrative of all. It's a meme. That's it. You either buy it or you sell it. If the meme gains traction, price tends to go up. One could also argue that some of these meme coins are the only way that retail, non-accredited investors can get access to the gains that are usually only seen by VCs and their inner crowd. Due to the SEC restricting retail participation in ICOs, meme coins are one of the few options for them to try and gain a hand at early stage launches. But it's not just retail that is diving into the meme coin meta. Institutional investors are also feeling the FOMO and are aping in as well. According to a recent report by Bybit, their allocations surged from 204 million in March to 293 million in April. I have heard from a number of people in private conversations of funds trying to hone their meme coin trading game market makers are also getting involved and are looking to support liquidity for meme coins as they seek broader exchange listings. It's, it's pretty crazy when you think about it. Now, we should be under no illusion here. Meme coins have no utility. They are not about building, they're about the vibes. They are player versus player, and the objective is to exit at a price higher than you bought it. Someone else will be hitting that bid. It reminds me of a quote from one of my favorite movies, uh, Margin Call, about the great financial crisis, where John Tilled told Sam Rogers, We are selling to willing buyers at the current fair market price. That's what meme coin trading is. It's also worth noting that many meme coins will go to zero. Not all, of course. Some have stood the test of time and have become blue chip memes themselves. Shiba Inu, Pepe, and of course the OG itself, Dogecoin. Speaking of which, if you watched Jess's interview with Arthur Hayes and Raoul Paul, both think that a Dogecoin ETF isn't outside the realm of possibility. This is a theory that I've seen being playing out on Twitter as well. Heck, even Jim Cramer asked Gary Gensler on CNBC why we don't have uh, ETFs for the likes of Bonk or Doge. Pretty wild times, man. And for those of you wondering, yes, we at the Coin Bureau have also dabbled in some meme coins. We've invested in Foxy, the primary culture coin on the linear layer two. This was actually one of the most interesting meme launches for us this cycle, as this was a reincarnation of that long awaited MetaMask airdrop. It was a wide airdrop, and there are a lot of plans at play to make it a broader mascot for the linear ecosystem. Some other members of the Coin Bureau team have also invested in meme coins. And if you are a Coin Bureau Club subscriber, you'll know exactly what they are. Again, link in the description. Oh, and warning some of them are next level degenerate. One thing I will say about meme coins, though, is that the latest wave of celeb meme coins are nothing but a cash grab. I would be extremely cautious before investing in any of these. You're likely to lose your money sooner or later. I would also strongly advise against you attempting to engage in any sort of price manipulation or pump coordination of these assets. In fact, just to be on the safe side, I wouldn't even issue any if I were you. Just because they are meme coins doesn't mean that the SEC and the Feds 
aren't taking notice. So if you want to invest in meme coins, have a strategy, one with a solidly defined entry and exit plan. Know the risks and adjust accordingly. And if you want more of an overview on trading meme coins, then you know where to go to get that good stuff down in the links below. Okay, that's it for our top narratives for Q3. Now, I need to caveat that this isn't an exhaustive list. For example, the AI narrative is also a really strong retail-driven one, but many of the Deepin projects mentioned earlier are well positioned to capture that hype. I mean, decentralized cloud computing will be a massive beneficiary of the insatiable demand for AI computing power, for example. There are also other narratives which I am personally bullish on in the infra space, for example, modularity and move VM, as well as Bitcoin layer twos. But as mentioned in the beginning, they are less interesting for the retail crowd in an alt season. Finally, there are narratives that could see a resurgence if regulations become more favorable. This includes many of the DeFi protocols on Ethereum, for example. If this were to come at a time when the Ethereum ETFs launched and brought about a flood of capital, well, that's even better. So be sure to keep that on your narrative watch list, perhaps one for Q4. Now, I would absolutely love to get your feedback. So which narratives are you bullish on? Are there any coins or tokens that we should have on our watch list? Let me know down in those comments below. And if you found this video helpful, then help me to help you. Hit that like button, tap the subscribe, and ding the bell as well. You don't want to miss a single Coin Bureau video. Until next time, CryptoCats, over and out.